Hi, so I'm Peter, I'm one of the Neurology Registrars here in Nottingham, although I'm joining you guys in a month by the looks of things. So I'll be charging around um, in Leicester. Right. If at any stage I say anything, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, I tend to rabbit on a little bit and I can go down some rabbit holes. Um, so hopefully today um, I might teach you all a little something um, about neuroprognostication and, and where we are at the moment and sort of how we approach these patients. Um, last time I did a talk, I talked a little bit about um, consciousness and it does tie in a little bit because uh, certainly with regards to some of the brain stem structures, they're clearly very, very important in um, assessing their function and will have a huge impact on prognostication. So there might be a few points if we go back over. Um, and I'm sorry if some things are too detailed, some, I'm sorry if other things are a little bit simple and if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, I apologise. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, uh, the impact of prognostication, why is it so important? Um, it's fairly relevant. Um, you know, if you take someone's tube out, they're going to die. You know, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. If you withdraw the life-sustaining treatment, they are going to die. So you need to be trying to select the correct patient group to do this on. Um, I know this study that I looked at, um, there is a study done in the States, and there is quite a disparity between countries in which they are more pro-carrying on regardless, and others such as here in the UK, where we're a bit more pragmatic and try to prevent doing unnecessary treatments and procedures and keeping people going when we think it's going to be futile. However, um, looking at uh, patients that um, they've withdrawn on, particularly early on in the first 72 hours, and trying to use computer models, I, whilst yes, these are very, very flawed numbers, they were sort of hinting at, well, they got towards double figures with regards to percentage of patients they thought might actually have done fairly well, at least had a favourable outcome. Very flawed study. I didn't really want to listen much more about it, but just it's just something to bear at the back of your mind is that, well, actually, there might be a cohort of patients that we are not doing the right thing for. Um, and of course, the, the, the flip side of the coin is, is those that uh, we keep going regardless of, of, of everything in front of us and they have a horrendous time. Um, one of the, this is clearly a, a European study where they looked, I think it was in Norway actually, they looked at a whole of patients and using computer models of those that had died. Um, it's a, I mean, there's deeply flawed, once again, studies, but predictive models um, saying that, well, even on those that, you know, look at the ones that they withdrew on, they thought that most of them would have died by 12 months anyway. So it probably was a good thing that they'd withdrawn. Um, just something to bear in mind, and this is going to be a repeated uh, problem, I think, in the ITU setting. Now, I've worked in ITU as an SHO, and I saw it all the time where the opinion of what is, well, this patient looks like they've had it. And yeah, if you enter in with that thought, the patient is going to die. And the, the, now this is compounded particularly with, well, this is a confirmation by compounded, particularly when you have um, false positives. That is a horrendous thing to have. If you have a test that you do has a false positive that says this patient can have a poor prognosis and you make your entire decision based on that, you know, you could have a patient that could have done well and um, it's, yeah, you were drawn on. So just something that with regards to our prognostic tests, these are things that we're looking for. And certainly a big red line and something we look for is false positives because the second these occur, we run into big issues. Um, I, I like to just pragmatically ask a few myself a few questions when I see somebody and we're going through this process. And I'm sure that these are things that you, you've all thought of several times. Now, you look at the patient at that time and the thought is, you know, what is their functionality now and, and what are they going to regain? And it's the age of question. They always ask you, well, you know, is my mum going to be my mum when they wake up? Or what are they going to be able to do? And often you sort of say, well, how long is a piece of string? I've no idea, really. And but you need to ask yourself this, um, you know, and how long, how long are they going to be in hospital? How long is it going to take to require my own personal within a uh, personal rule of thumb with any neurological injury is your your first 
few weeks is your most rapid improvements. Once you hit six months, you're going to slow right down. Anything after six months is sort of a bonus and towards a year. But of course, as I, you know, I've definitely seen you, this this whole time frame can be shifted. If somebody gets septic on the ITU unit, this does do a delay in that recovery. I had a, a patient um, last year who just kept and kept and kept and getting um, pneumosepsis. And actually he did very, very well. There was a delay and you know, he sort of went through his uh, his coma, his unresponsive wakefulness, and actually got some quite good recovery. But there's a big delay because of these infections and things going on. But of course, if you have an elderly patient, they're going to get an infection in that time frame. It's going to go badly. And, you know, you always have to also say, well, would their recovery, would that be in keeping with their values? What quality of life they would, would they have? Now, personally, if I get a pre left prefrontal cortex injury, don't wake me up. I don't want that. But, you know, everyone's going to be slightly different you know, um, but it does bear bearing in mind, and I'm sure you guys in IT unit are very good at chatting with the family about this, but equally family can be fairly unrealistic. And number four is very, very difficult. And this is something I'd like to explore with this talk is the confidence. You do a test, how confident can you be with your predictions based on the information you're given? And that's very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Um, I, I think that's something that's something a little bit we don't really think about enough. Um, we get a test and we think, well, that's the result. Great, let's carry on. It's not always quite that simple. Okay. Um, whenever you approach a patient, the first and most simple thing is examination. Um, you all do it, and ideally, that that it should be done after seventy-two hours. They need to be off the sedation, and you can't just do one assessment. You need to go back, do it again and again and again. You're looking for change. Yes, you're looking for the initial impression, but you're looking for any improvement or deterioration um, with time. And you know, certainly some of the brain injury patients, um, it's you know, weekly, 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 going back and even in six months still examining them. Of course, in ITU setting, this is it's going to be a shorter period of time, but um, you've got to keep on going back. Um, I just very, very briefly want to touch on GCS. Um, I did talk about this last time. I don't really want to get into depth with it. Um, it clearly, if you have a, a, a poor motor response after 72 hours, things are going to go badly. Um, you know, the sensitivity is relatively low, though. So even if you have got a poor um, motor response, you, you could be all right. You, you could still do badly. It's it, it's it, it's not the most sensitive thing in the world. Clearly, the specificity is going to be very, very good. A patient with a horrendously low GCS is going to do badly in the long term if it's consistently low. And most patients have a low GCS. You know, pay, pay patients have a poor outcome will have had a low GCS. So that's the specificity. Um, of course, in ITU, it's massively flawed. Um, there's intraoperator uh, intra uh, variability is huge. Um, the eye signs are, are poorly done and fairly useless. The, 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 the V aspect of it is completely useless on the ITU unit. Um, so it does have its, its problems. Um, the, the thing about it though is pretty much anyone can do it. Um, and that's one of the reasons we keep on plugging on with it. Um, you can improve this. Um, I'll bring up a little bit later about doing the four score and we'll get into that a little bit more. It's slightly more useful in the IT unit. Um, but it is something that is probably the first test you're going to do and you're going to go back and keep on doing it. Uh, pupillary light reflex, I talked about also in my last talk. Pupillary light reflex is brilliant for localization. Any of the eye signs are fantastic for localization. Very, very specific. Uh, you know, a patient with a poor outcome, they're probably not going to have a um, much of a light reflex. False positive rate's pretty low. Sensitivity rate, though, is horrendously low as well. So, um, I, you know, in isolation, it is not great, but it's very, very useful. And certainly for prognostication, it's something you can do very, very quickly, have a look at, but once again, not on its own. Um, if you combine this then with the corneal reflex, you get very similar numbers. The corneal reflex, very simply to do. I, To be honest, when I worked in ITU, I think I was the only person that ever did it. It's a bit of a fact to do. People tend to do it in the wrong place. Um, you're going for the cornea. So, the you know, it, it's it's not the nicest thing for a patient, particularly not nice for families to see. But once again, it's good for localization. The um, specificity is very, very high with it, but the sensitivity is low. So we run into issues. You're not, the false positives, I think, are pretty low with the corneal reflex. So it, these are good tests, 
but once again, not in isolation. And clearly somebody who's got a horrendous brainstem injury with absence of these reflexes is not going to do well. But once again, on their own, they're not going to just tell you uh, that um, how, you know, they could still do badly even if they are missing, even if they are, are present. Um, and I mentioned the four score. Um, that's by a neurologist uh, down at which this guy at the bottom, which Dicks. He's down at the Mayo Clinic in it's Minnesota, I think he came up with this. He's done a hell of a lot with neuro ITU prognostication. Um, and this is to try and make things slightly more applicable to the ITU unit. Um, certainly the eyes are a lot more detailed. Motor is pretty much the same, slightly more detailed, but, um, but very nice with the breathing patterns. That's fantastic um, to consider. And I'm sure you would have seen this on the unit. Their reliance on the ventilator setting, you know, on the vent is, is really, really useful. Their, their breathing patterns is very, very useful. The only issue with it is it's, it's not been really ro rolled out um, globally that well. There aren't any large studies looking at um, at its in prognostication and how well these patients do as yet um, uh, uh, in the literature anyway. Um, and I'm sorry, he did make his, <laughs> the guy who came up with it did say pretty much if you have a very low, with a, in meningitis though, with a low four score, you're gonna do badly. Um, but we, once again, we don't have this applied to large numbers of patients. Any questions up to now? Okay. Uh, I'll take that as stunned silence. I hope you can you all hear me. Just checking. Yes, thank you. Cool, cool. I'm just checking. Sorry, it's really difficult when I can't see faces. Um, so I, I thought I'd just also look at a few other signs. So um, myoclonus. Now, I, I seem to spend my life trying to explain to people what clonic movements are. And I think myoclonus is a extremely important sign. Um, I think it's poorly recognized but it's quite useful. And I think first things first, I need to explain what myoclonus is because it is very useful describing a clonic movement, what it is, recognizing it. Certainly when you're trying to work out if somebody is seizing, knowing what clonus is, is so important to try and distinguish that from tremor. You know, clonus is, a, well, myoclonus is a hyperkinetic movement disorder with, you yeah, these jerks, but it's of the muscle. Okay, and that could use contraction or inhibition. If you think about a clonic movement, it's got a fast contraction phase and a slow relaxation phase. All of us have experienced a, a clonic movement, a myoclonic jerk, and particularly um, if you think about a hypnic jerk, as you're going to sleep, if you think about it very carefully, you're going to sleep, one leg flies out very rapidly and then it slowly relaxes back again. A fast contraction, slow relaxation phase. This is very, very important. Why I'm emphasizing this is this is how you need to be able to distinguish this movement from a tremor, a shake, a volitional movement. The patient who is having an epileptic seizure has a clonic movement. It is a fast movement in one direction, a slow relaxation phase in the opposite direction. So if you see them tr tremulous, shaking in, 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 in the middle of a seizure, it's one of the ways we distinguish between uh, seizures and non-epileptic seizures. And it is extremely, extremely important. You need to look at that movement when they're moving. In this particular context, it's very, very important because certainly for, um, for many years, we thought of um, it heralding poor prognosis. Now, where does it come from? In, so myoclonus tends to come from one of three places, either the peripheral nerve, the spinal cord, or the brain itself. Um, for most intents and purposes, it tends to come from the brain. The most commonly it comes from the brain. Um, yes, if you go into a spinal unit, you'll see it from the spine. But what we're thinking about mainly is it coming from the brain. And we think about the brain, these are usually a disruption in the subcortical firing, the inhibition in the subcortex going wrong, and it's where you've got damage, particularly if you think about watershed and fox, it's very important, you're going to get myoclonus. Um, so it's quite common uh, post-cardiac arrest, and the false positive rate is relatively low, sensitivity once again is low. Um, the, the issue with all of this is the trouble with myoclonus is, yes, if it's there, it, it often heralds uh, bad news. Um, there's a few nuances to that. There's case reports of it doing, doing well. There's also a very rare condition called Lance Allen syndrome, which can occur after a cardiac arrest or hypoxic injury, where you can almost get sort of a start on myoclonus. It actually has a converse as associated with a good prognosis. But it, these are once again, little things to look out for. These are the things we're looking out for 
um, when we go to see these patients when they're saying, okay, they've got absent corneal reflex, they've got a poor motor response, they've got an absence, light reflex, they've got myoclonus. So these are examination findings that we're going to think of, take us more down the route of a poor prognosis. All right. Um, I'm going to move now just into some of the investigations briefly, the important ones that certainly will be relevant. I won't show the video because I think it'll take a lot of time. It's probably going to crash this, this lovely NHS computer. Um, somatosensory evoke potentials. I, I think these are underdone. I've actually not seen them done, certainly on our IT unit. I'm not sure if they do them in Leicester. You have a much better neurophysiology department than there is um, in Nottingham. So you may be able to request them. Uh, they're really useful. Essentially, you're, you're firing a signal down uh, the median nerve, uh, going up down the spinothalamic tract, and then measuring response um, in the primary somatosensory cortex, which is done at uh, 20 milliseconds, hence the N20 number is what we're looking at. Um, really, really useful. Uh, certainly, um, if it's absent, that's bad news. Um, you know that that's really, really it's, it's quite it's, it's a very very good test to do um so yeah exactly near 100 percent specificity so if it's not there it, you know, patient is going to do all the patients that do badly tend to have it absent so it, it's a very very good test to do um it, however the sensitivity is not great um so once again we we it's sort of like flipping a coin almost the false positive rate is also pretty low. It's a good test. It's a, I, I, I think it's underused. It's not, I've not really seen it done on the ITU units at all ever. Um, it tends to be something we reserve, actually we see it, see it done on the functional patients, um, but otherwise very rarely used. Um, the, the test you're probably much more familiar with is the EEG. Um, the EEG really is the cornerstone of your prognostication tests. It's fantastic. People look at EEGs and they go, oh, you know, it's just important if they're fitting. No. No. Yes, it's great to see that they're not fitting because that's a beautiful reversible condition that you can get improvement on. The EEG tells you a hell of a lot about the base brain functioning. Is it working? What it's doing? Um, it, it's You can look for just simple brain activity. You know, all of us, when we close our eyes, we have um, uh, this lovely alpha rhythm at the back of our brains that you can measure um, in somebody who's got a large neurological insult that starts going wrong you get generalized uh, slowing of most of our brain activity when one's encephalopathic um and certainly there are some very very poor um uh, wave pattern forms that are, will be associated with a poor prognosis these highly malignant patterns the birth suppression where um, you get runs i'll show you in a moment runs of activity and then nothing and then runs of activity is clearly a very, very, very a bad sign. And if there's nothing, that's, well, that's not going to do well at all. Um, so yeah, once again, this is a reoccurring theme is the sensitivity is a poor with all of these things. Um, there's another thing you can look for is reactivity. Um, I'll show you in a second what happens in reactivity. You're looking for, basically, the thing they tend to do is clap and look for change in the EEG um, in response to that. And clearly, if you can't react to your outside environment, that's also associated with, associated with a poor prognosis. Um, just to try and make this a bit more, uh, more visual so you can see things. Um, so these are two EEGs um, that are taken from the Lancet. Um, so two patients that had really well they didn't survive but they're awfully EGs. the top one is a very good example of birth suppression you can see this gap of at least eight seconds where there's no activity and you get this little run it's quite slow it's probably of 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 alpha activity um highly abnormal but it's a short burst and then we're back into this flat line um uh, actually we uh, you might see this in patients status epilepticus status epilepticus we aim for this to try and give them birth suppression for around about 10 seconds to uh, to try and control seizures for 24 hours but clearly in a patient who's not sedated um, have barely any brain activity that's going to be a poor prognosis um, the example below in b with this patient this is suppression this isn't birth suppression this is suppression there's a few very slow sort of delta waves which are never very good to see unless somebody's in deep sleep and have this reoccurring delta rhythm um, but at best, and you can see, you might be able to see at the number 10, I don't see my mouse, uh, but the number 10, there's, there's a little mark, they've basically done, done a clap 
and there's been no change in brain activity. And for some of the sharper eyed of you, you might see they actually have a run of ventricular tachycardia on the ECG right at the bottom. Um, and both of these patients um, didn't survive. So, so it, this is a very useful thing to see, uh, clearly it has these malignant rhythms, but equally, so this is an epileptiform rhythm. I know this for you, most of this is just a squiggle for most of you, um, but you get this, you know, the epilepsy, you get the sharp components and then the slow uh, repolarization area afterwards. So there's a sharpish region right at the beginning here. This is quite epileptiform. You can look at the isoelectric part of it to see where this is coming from. But actually the fact they've got an epileptiform rhythm Okay, that's a tr something that's treatable, reversible. Um, if you look at the top round of the 15 marks, the 15, uh, 15 mark, they've done a clap and it is, sorry, um, there is some response. There's some change in the brain activity. There's a sharp, um, you can see, I don't know if you can see right on that 15 line, there's a bit of a sharp wave and, and it's in all of the leads and that's a response to the clap. So there's some reactivity if you contrast that to above here at the 10 where they, they clap and literally there's nothing. Uh, and that's a bit of the eye of faith you have to take it with and i appreciate most of this looks like just a squiggle for you you can get a hell of a lot out of this you've got reactivity you've got reversible rhythm and this patient did very very well so the eeg is extremely extremely important i think it's underdone underutilized I mean, you talk to the technicians um they're very insightful they can tell you a heck of a lot about the patient just at the time you don't have to wait for the formal report um, i definitely chat with them um fantastic test um Probably more familiar to you is going to be the imaging. Okay, I'm sure all of you sat clustered around screens looking at uh, brain imaging. Um, your first test you're always going to get is going to be the CT scan. Um, CT scan, simple, quick, easy to do. You're basically looking, uh, you're looking for a cerebral edema. Um, you know, in cerebral edema, you get the sulcal effacement. If you look at this picture, you've lost that lovely cauliflower-like appearance of the brain. The sulci are gone. They're completely effaced. Um, even if you look at the ventricles, they're quite small in this patient. I know this isn't the best slice, but uh, this is a hypoxic brain injury. Um, it, it's, it's, you can see the edema. Uh, well, you can just look for the, the gray-white interface, the difference between the gray matter and the white matter. You can use a computer system to actually check for the change in color and the difference between the color between the two. If it's basically homogenous and it's the same color, they're gonna do very, very badly. Um, you, so they do the ratios. Um, the issue with all of these things is in order to avoid false positives, they've had to be fairly generous and basically have a, a, a definitely poor, poor, poor outcome. Um, so you're looking at these gray white ratios of 1.1, 1.2. So rather than just almost hitting on 1.0 uh, before anyone's going to say this is a poor prognosis. But once again, isolation is an issue. You get sensitivity of 44%. So you can't just rely on these tests on their own. Okay. Um, MRI uh, it is slightly better. Um, MRI, there's a nuance to this. Uh, you guys always ask us about you know, when do we do the MRI? Well, the big problem is we're looking at diffusion weighted imaging is, is one of the main tests we look at. And around about day seven, you get the pseudo normalization. So you've got to be quite careful. Um, you've got two MRIs here on, um, on the left um, is the, the flare. So that's one of the things you look for. Um, on the flare, you look at the, the looking at the grey matter. This clearly this is quite a swollen brain, and you've lost the architecture of the grey matter. So flare is very useful, and diffusion weighted, which is on the right, which you need to have done earlier on, um, is very very useful for looking for areas of diffusion restriction, um, which would correlate with areas of damage. And um, once again, we go back to this whole age of problems, greatly specific sensitivity is a little bit better though, uh, particularly when you combine the two imaging, uh, two uh, imaging modalities together. So it's, it's far superior to CT with definitely regards to the sensitivity, um, but it's still in isolation, you can't just look at, uh, at the MRI. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what use you have in Leicester with blood biomarkers. Um, I, I don't know if you're using brain specific analyze yet. Um, every single month, if you look at any of the journals, there's like a million more of them. Um, so basically, you have the breakdown products in urines and astrocytes. You can measure them in the serum. That's actually not entirely correct on its own. There's a lot more you can look for. Uh, you can even look for mRNAs, and they can be detected in saliva. 
Um, you can see which proteins have been produced um, in response to neuronal damage. You can go to horrendous depths if you really want to. The issues they're not really being standardized and rolled out everywhere. I don't think the access is a bit of an issue. Um, the main ones up to now is, is the NSC, the GFAP, uh, neurofilament light chain, the S100B uh, are around. So the most common ones, there'll be a few more floating around. Um, the neuron specific enolase is a, has been tested a little bit. We use it, you know, some centers to use it. Um, I don't know in Leicester how much you use. There's huge variability between the studies and um, their cutoffs, even within the studies, varies quite a lot. So I think it's a bit of a nightmare for the labs to work out, therefore, what their cutoff should be. And they're usually quite generous. Um, so basically, they, they, you know, you, you need a, a horrendous brain injury before they're going to say that it's going to correlate um, with a poor prognosis. Um, I don't know. Do do, do any of you have any any? Do you have any of you used any uh, um, any of these biomarkers in Leicester? I don't think they have the Glenfield. No, I don't think they are. I mean, certainly Nottingham. I've not seen them done at all. Um, yeah, it's a matter uh, of we, time. But we haven't had anything at the Royal along these lines. But of course, I'll be asking for them next week. <laughs> I think, I mean, like I said, the trouble is the studies are just so heterogeneous. Uh, you, you're not, nobody's really agreed uh, definitively on that. I'll get in a minute, in a moment, actually, it's going to come up now, because this is from the uh, EAN, it's, uh, European Association of Neurology. They, they, they've they looked at, and even then they've been a bit vague about their NSE levels, but they did use NSE to try and make a bit of a timeline of when you know, they propose how we should uh, manage these patients in our post prognostication. Um, certainly with a lot of these, particularly up to now, I've mentioned most of these studies and things are based on um, hypoxic brain injury. I'll go through a few more specifics in a minute, but um, certainly with the hypoxic brain injury, um, the approach really is you get your, okay, I didn't go into temperature because I, I leave that to you guys, you know far more about uh, temperature control than I do. With regards to cooling um but essentially your first uh first thing you're going to do is going to be examining your basic examinations your ct scan bringing in the sseps and and depending on these you're going to start going up for the more complicated tests this is really just a very vague guideline of going into things um and when you do the mris and, and ct scans but certainly you have your first initial CT scan, have your examination around about 72 hours, uh, request your MRI and request your EEG and go from there really. Um, your considerations when it comes to more specific conditions, you do need to take some things into consideration. I'll go through one or two of these in a moment just because I think there are a few nuances. Um, just one thing that struck with me, one of my one of senior consultants at, um, at Nottingham, he'd said, he just said about meningococcus meningitis, they can look absolutely horrendous, but do really, really well. They can, they, you, you can get caught out. And a lot of these conditions you can get caught out with. So just bear that in mind. Um, TBI has a few nuances to it. Um, age, an old person who gets, has a traumatic brain injury is not going to do well even more so it's the single greatest determinant um, with TBI is going to be your age. A lot of patients do particularly badly. Um, and then as regards to ICP, if the pressure is raised um, and they have a hemicraniectomy, they're still, it's bad that the pressure was raised in the first place. Um, if you don't do decompression, um, they're clearly going to die. And when you do do decompression, they still have a very high mortality. And it's quite interesting is the, is the cost in these, that the cost of quality of life, <laughs> the one study from Australia where they looked at uh, several thousand people with TBI and uh, I mean, huge, huge cost involved uh, with these patients. Um, and the outcomes aren't great. There's a bit of variability between centers and outcomes. So I wouldn't take these as, as absolutes, um, even between these two figures I've given you, mortality of 30% and then 42% of a good outcome. It, it's very, very variable. Um, so it is very, there's a lot of intercenter inter variability. Um, one thing you do need to be aware of with the, the TBIs, 
is a sympathetic eye activity or the storming that they get. Um, that can worsen prognosis, particularly if not corrected. I believe it responds well to opiates, but then uh, I was probably teaching you intensivists how to suck eggs. Um, but so these things to keep out because that will confound um, your prognostication if they then have a secondary insult. Stroke. Um, stroke, obviously hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic versus ischemic. Uh, it's very the the it's the underlying pathology behind it is going to uh, completely change um, your prognosis um, and the location. If you've got a pontine hemorrhage, you, you're not going to survive. Um, let's take a message, and then if you do have either a bleed or you have uh, an ischemic stroke, it's the space occupation either by edema or by the blood itself is going to be a problem. If you need to evacuate it, you need to be able to evacuate it. So the location is a problem. If it is a deep brain structure, you can't just decompress or evacuate. So that will once again change your prognosis significantly. And infection. Um, infection, uh, a few other things. Um, antibiotics, I'm sure you can just have been beaten into you by the uh, infection control team. But the critical determinant is the uh, how quickly you get antibiotics. If there is delay, there's a horrendous odd ratio going up every hour after 12 hours. The odds ratio of a poor outcome 1.3 per hour, which is it's not great. Um, some of the complications, uh, cerebral edema, things to look out for. Science thrombosis, uh, hydrocephalus. If you're not in a neuroscience center and they develop hydrocephalus and you just shunt, then you've got a bit of an issue. I mean, sorry, a drain. You've got a bit of a problem. Um, and definitely, um, I'm sure you've seen this. If you, literally, I've got a patient at the moment. The first question was somebody's got bacterial meningitis, uh, he's got meningoencephalitis. Um, do they have systemic infection? Because if they are systemically unwell, that's going to completely complicate factors. If they go into multi organ failure, that's going to complicate your prognostication. Okay. And there's a few just examples of when the prognosis is very, very poor. Um, you know, if you have a massive, massive hemispheric swelling, once your brainstem reflexes start going, and that's basically you're doing as you do for brainstem death testing. Um, once those brainstem reflexes are gone, that's it. It doesn't really matter what the cause is. Um, TBI, um, if you've got brainstem uh, problems, corpus callosum, deep brain structures, it's going to go badly. This goes without saying. Pontine hemorrhage, as I mentioned, uh, thalamic, with, with particularly if you've got thalamic extension, you have issues. Uh, basilar artery. If you don't open the basilar artery and it goes off, you've got um, the two scans you've got here. The top right is a basilar artery thrombosis. I mean, that patient's not surviving that. Um, and the bottom is uh, pontine hemorrhage. So once again, very, very poor prognosis. Um, just in summary, just a couple of final things that, you know, certainly personally that I like to think about um, and comes to mind. First thing is don't be a rush. When you come to these patients, they need time. You've got to keep on coming back. I can't say this enough. You go back, you examine them, you go back, you examine them. Um, if there's anything confounding, you need to repeat the tests, particularly things like EEGs. You've got to get them off the medication. IT, this is a huge problem. We often get asked to see the patients and they were on Ridazolam for a week or something and you know, it's, you, you, that's always stopped now before you saw them. You, you can't say anything at that point. They need to be completely off the medications, well, where possible, whatever you can get them off of, um, of course. And confounders, 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 confounders. Is there something that can be complex, that can be changing your results? Is your GCS poor because of medication? That's the most common thing is, is medications. Um, you know, if somebody's still sedated, yes, you're going to get uh, some of these, these results are going to be poor. Your EEG is going to be slow. If they're on uh, any benzos, the EEG, they can get sharp waves, it can complicate things. Um, yeah, so there's a lot you need to look at all of these tests. Don't take them in isolation. Is there something confounding your results? And is there something correctable? If somebody is fitting, great, we can stop them fitting. Well, most of the time, um, you know, let's get on and treat it. That's once again confounding uh, your results and your prognosis treated. Um, so yeah, seizures, 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 seizures. Can we can we stop them happening and make a big improvement? Um, I, I just this is just a slide from it's just from continuum. Uh, I just just in summary, just right at the end, just to finish with.
of course, it depends on the individual, uh, on the individual themselves. It's going to be what their reserve is like, how personally they are good at um, surviving the initial trauma as well as the reserve, the, the injury itself. And, you know, once again, would their outcome be acceptable to them? And that's going to boil down to communication with the family as well as just their current state and your assessments. Any questions? I think that's it. I have flown through, but I'm more than happy to have a chat. Thanks, Dr. Sellers. That was great. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Stunned silence. No, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it's it, it's it's quite a difficult uh, uh, subject, and I, I do appreciate that, particularly juniors. You, you don't really do it. Um, yeah. And even we we tend to get called in every now and then. I, I yeah. Peter, I'm sitting here with my hand up. It's Mike Dussel from the Royal. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, hi, hi, sir. No, you're you're okay. It's uh, I, I think Matt's been distracted. I think one of the the things from an observational point of view here and about neuroprognostication is is most importantly, um, what has caused them to be in intensive care in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and we see a very different cohort to that that uh, might be seen at the Glenfield where mm. you're getting more out of hospital cardiac arrests and hypoxic brain injury where actually what you've said about timing and 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 all the observations you've made uh, mm. certainly after 72 hours are very important um, and it's that sort of not rushing into it um, and making sure where, where they're going to be as you said in six months time. I found that's feels slightly different from those that maybe we get coming in through the Royal who have got massive uh, hemorrhage or ischemic insult and there yeah. seems to be a, a huge difference in those people where I, I, I remember one patient um, who had a massive uh, interparenchymal hemorrhage and we're all going or oh, sort of what was it about two three days in this is just going very bad is this is not going to survive and then the next morning he was waving at me um albeit with only one side of his uh, body the bleeds tend to do quite well they yeah. uh, it's the location and that's and that's also once again why they bled where the what what's bleeding uh, yeah. you know uh, what is the underlying pathophysiology behind the bleed it was a hypertensive bleed that's very different to somebody says got a cerebral vasculitis or something you know yeah uh, if somebody's got amyloid everywhere and they've had a CAA that's bled, I mean, they're probably 93 in the shade in the first place. They're not going to do well, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's your cohort will depend on, and that's the trouble with this, the whole stroke cohort is that the, you know, the, the pathophysiology behind it is quite heterogeneous. Yeah. Um, it just it just makes it quite quite difficult, um, especially sort of putting something broadly. And I quite like the the idea of um, the slide you put there for. When you're doing certain tests, but uh, but again, I've known where we've had patients who are brainstem dead off sedation for mm. uh, for 24 hours and short acting sedation um, at 36, 48 hours in, um, and and you just go, well, <laughs> what can I, what am I going to change oh, at, at, at that point? But it's just, uh, I think I think everything everything there is incredibly important, and certainly using. I don't know where our SSEPs disappeared off to because uh, we did. I'm, I'm sure we had them around the time Dr. Charlton was around uh, the Royal, but um, they seem to have disappeared. I did. I didn't take them with me. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm gonna check the back of your car. <laughs> Simon. Hi, uh, hi. I'm Simon Scott. I'm one of the intensive care consultants at the Royal. Sorry, I, I missed the start of your talk, but. Um, Thank you for you know the bit I did so it was fantastic. Um, one thing I've always thought was quite interesting is that we're very much swayed by visual indicators of brain injury, but less swayed by functional assessment, mm. as in you know EEG, SSEPs, mm. uh, and it, it's something because you know you know a CT scan or an MRI would have show structures, it doesn't show the effect of the harm to those structures had on the patient. And yes, we do do clinical assessments, but I, I mean, are, 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 is there any progress in, in improved functional studies of the brain? Yes. So, there, I mean, there's quite a lot. I, I mean, so I, I mean, I think sort of, well, functionally, very, very difficult. Um, 
Oh, the, 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 there's a lot to be done. So I think like Megan's stuff. I was trying to look into one of my colleagues here has done a whole lot of stuff on Megan TBI, and uh, there's some promise there because Meg, you get quite good spatial resolution of what the electrical activity is like. Right. Um, I mean, there's things on F on fMRI in the past. There's a whole big drive for it about 10 years ago. fMRI, they were putting on locked in patients and they got them to see. The trouble is the reproducibility is horrendous with all of these things. Yeah. Um, you know, I know in London there was this one patient where literally they oh, he could communicate locked in with the fMRI and they're like, oh, we'll give it to everyone. And no, they didn't, not another patient, even the patient they did it on, it, it was quite inconsistent. So not really functionally most of it, the functional stuff is going to be the examination but you're completely right though in that we all look at the scans because it's nice and big and visual and we look at the scan and go we know what we're looking at no one the eegs that's what i said eeg you need to chat with the technicians because it's that background activity is extremely extremely useful and one other thing i thought i just sort of came to mind is it's quite scary it was it comes to long-term outcomes the neuronal disability visual the measurable effects that you can see but no one's ever done a baseline before the injury. And I mean, if you really think that this person is, is you know, we, we, you know the person could have been a member of Mensa beforehand. We're saying, yes, well, you can you can make a cup of tea now. It's very, very different. Yeah. The, 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 the more higher brain functions will be taken out. Um, whether that's acceptable to the patient, I know. I mean, it doesn't really enter into the conversation. Um, then, well, we, I mean, yeah. We know just being a patient with intensive care has cognitive effects. Um, sometimes quite subtle, but you're right. If you're functioning at a very high level already, those subtle effects can be quite damaging in terms of career and jobs and the place you see yourself. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Great. Any more questions? Questions from you guys? Any more questions from anyone else in the chat? Next one. No, thank you very much. That was really That's no problem. Yeah. See you all soon. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Excellent. Um, so, hi all. So, my name's Steve. So, I'm one of the um, junior fellows at Leicester Royal Infirmary um, and been there for about a year now. Um, so, Journal Club today is based on a paper and a trial called the Sensor Trial. And essentially, it was looking at the early use of noradrenaline in septic shock resuscitation. Um, and so, Moving forward, so a little bit about the, the trial itself. So it's single centred, so it's based in Thailand. It was double blinded, um, so the nurse and doctors were unaware of what drug was in a in the trial infusion container. Um, and then the randomization and the drug prep was done by people away from the patient care. Um, and essentially it was looking at um, starting low dose neuro neuroadrenaline peripherally. Um, versus a control group, which was infusion of 5% dextrose. Um, and this was conducted October um, 2013 and went on for about four years. So to separate it into the PICO, so PICO is the population intervention comparing outcome. So the people it looked at was adults um, age 18 or over with suspected sepsis in the emergency room um, that were seen within the hour. The intervention was low dose noradrenaline infusion um, and then comparing that to 5% dextrose infusion, which was the placebo controlled infusion. And then it looked at its primary outcome was shock control rate at six hours. Um, so looking through the paper and a few of the references that it's done. So the shock control rate is, or as they suggested is, achieving a map of over 65 for over 15 minutes and then either two consecutive hours of urine output over 0.5 mils per kilo per hour so that for two hours or a degree a decrease in the serum lactate of over 10 percent from the admission lactate so um so that was how they did it. And there's some evidence behind, obviously, a map above 65 helps um, tissue perfusion, um, which can be seen in things like urine outputs and then the lactate clearance. Uh, so a bit about background. So vasopressors, um, there's no 
single way when to start vasopressors. presses. So usually um, we start them after fluid therapy when it hasn't resolved the hypotension um, and instead of giving more fluids at the risk of things like pulmonary edema and things, we would aim to give a vasopressor to squeeze. Um, and then another thing that's also highly variable is the amount of fluid therapy that's given and then the time to initiate vasopressors. It can vary amongst cl clinicians and the more senior clinicians may be more liberal with the fluid therapy, um, but it is, it is variable and there's no right way, right amount. There's very few, looking at the, looking a bit further into the data that was available at the time, so before 2013, there's very few prospective studies looking at the optimal time of starting vasopressors. Um, there were, there's the surviving sepsis guidelines that suggested um, maybe consider after over 30 mils of crystalloid fluid per kilo has been given, then you should start vasopressors with NORAD being the, the prime one to give. Um, and then other studies that are available were available at the time. So several single centred retrospective studies. Um, so one of the ones they look at is uh, in this paper they um, reference is uh, a rat model. So using endotoxin um, and apparently noradrenaline helped improve flow to the ulcer and mesentery. And then there's a couple that looked at um, different MAC targets and um, mortalities. But again, these are all single centred and retrospective. So actually the reproducibility is questionable. So that's a bit about the background of it. So this trial, so as pretty much what I said earlier on, so over 18 in the ER room, in the emergency room, screened within one hour of it, emergency room um, presentation, MAP of under 65 with a suspected infection as a source of why the patient's behaving as is. Lots of exclusion criteria, um, which you kind of think a lot of these wouldn't necessarily have a, a sepsis infection with it, um, but these are what was listed as the exclusion criteria. Um, the main one to note was the immediate surgery. So if someone has a perforated uh, large bowel or small bowel, then they wouldn't be eligible for the trial. And despite actually being that being a sepsis related issue. So the intervention, so noradrenaline, um, so low dose noradrenaline, which looking at the data and what is, uh, there's evidence behind its safe use is four milligrams in 250 mils of dextrose. Um, and that is seen, that's known to be safe across multiple trials and studies um, and it is slowly becoming more in practice anyway. Um, so this inf this was infused at a rate of, of 0.5 um, mics per kilo per hour, which in a 70 kilo person would be about 208 mics per hour or 13 mils. Um, so es essentially it's just under three mils of single strength NORAD, which we would traditionally give. And this was infused for 24 hours without titration. So comparing the with that with a control arm, which was the dextrose, this was given at the same rate. So again, 17, 70 kilo person would receive 30 mils an hour. So it's exactly the same, so to help with blinding. So beyond the actual trial itself, so management was based on the surviving sepsis guide campaign guidelines of 2012, um, which basically starts off the sepsis six as we know it. Um, and with that, they allowed open label vasopressors in either group. So whichever arm they're in, if their map was below 65 um, after a fluid bolus of 30 mils per kilo, as I said earlier. Then after the initial resus and stabilization, they were either moved to the intensive care unit and they're stated if they're needing um, organ support or more invasive monitoring, or move to a general medical ward. That's even if they had the noradrenaline infusion. So its primary outcome was that shock control rate, which I said about, um, which was MAP above 65 for 15 minutes, or urine output above um, 0.5 per mil per kilo. Um, 
And then it also looked at secondary outcomes, which the trial is not necessarily set up for, but it looked at it anyway. So mortality, um, rate of organ failure, organ support three days, and then it's safety outcomes. So what complications are associated with um, starting things like noradrenaline. So it's based on its own study in, from its own unit. They calculated that they, the sample size were calculated um, to enrol 150 participants per group to, to achieve at least 80% power to assess the difference. Um, again, that was just based on their own data. So again, that's kind of um, not necessarily reproducible um, and as valid. So screening, so 456 screened, 136 excluded, and basically were on, as per their exclusion criteria, things like people who are end of life, um, if they're lucky enough to have two clinical trials going on in the emergency department, um, 20 were enrolled, were co-enrolled to another trial, um, and some didn't give consent, 320 were randomised, and then 10 withdrew consent, so seven from the intervention arm, three from placebo. So that was after they're randomized. With the randomization, they were matched um, age, past medical history, so source of sepsis, um, and then things like the Apache 2 scores as well. So looking at the data and the primary outcome, so this, this shock control rate that they were aiming for their primary outcome um, at six hours, um, it had an odds ratio of 3.4 with a p-value of less than um, 1,000. Um, so we, by giving noradrenaline, naturally we achieved a map much sooner than not giving noradrenaline. Um, it's hard to look at it crudely um, in that sense. And then moving on to secondary outcomes. So there's no difference in mortality, um, which we'll go on to a little bit in a minute. Um, the same amount of fluid was given over those six hours, um, disregarding whichever arm they were in, it was about uh, it was a good few liters, but it didn't change, which is kind of controversial because normally we would give vasopressors to try and help conserve the amount of fluids we get. Um, so it didn't change who needed ITU admission. It didn't change who needed uh, respiratory support, renal support. And the organ support three days um, to organ support three days to 28 days was not significant. And then I said earlier about the safety outcome. So one thing they did notice was um, that by giving the early noradrenaline, it um, decreased the incidence of things like pulmonary edema and new onset arrhythmias, um, which um, despite them having the same amount of fluids, it was still significantly more significantly different to between the arms. So I was looking at the second outcomes. So in their discussions, so they discuss that the hypothesis was proven and it's statistically significant. Um, but then it goes on to talk about quite a few limitations within the trial itself. So naturally, if you give a noradrenaline, you're going to see a blood pressure rise. So actually, you're Un, unintentionally um, unmasking the blinding of the trial. Um, and then it also states that actually people in the intervention arm, so early noradrenaline, responded the same as people in the placebo. It doesn't really go into much detail about that, but it says responded similarly, whether it was high blood, high blood pressure or low blood pressure doesn't say. Uh, 47% of patients were actually went to the medical ward and then moving on to that, noradrenaline is un very unlikely to be used outside critical care around the world um, because of its, its risk and its need for monitoring. Um, and I think this was use or the reason why they were able to do it because the general medical wards had nursing staff of one to three as opposed to the one to one to six, one to eight plus that we can have on our general medical wards here. Um, and then it was not assessed, designed to assess mortality, but however, looking at the figures, so the early noradrenaline at 28 days had less deaths than the 
um, control group, which if you increase, and the p-value is 0.15, if you increase the amount of participants, you might actually get something that's statistically significant. Um, so it's something that, although it's not designed to assess mortality, the numbers, if you increase the recruitment numbers, you might get something that's significant that might help change practice. So looking from my point of view, so it was a phase two trial um, and it's prospective, reasonable size. Um, so it will add to the literature um, regarding the timing of vasopressor use, um, we have to go for early. Um, and then it also will build, will form building blocks for other studies to evaluate this further, which I'll go on to in a sec. Weaknesses, so it's single centered, so the reproducibility uh, we we can't, no one's been able to or done similar trial um, like this at that time. So actually it's reproducibility is uh, questionable and then it's validity as well. The big thing, the clinicians were unblinded despite being double blinded because the drug increases something that you can visually see and you've actually got to use to clinically treat. And then, I, then it was this primary outcome being clinic unlikely to be clinically meaningful. So although vasopressors were given early, the fluid management was essentially the same. The amount of people needing organ support was there was no difference between the groups. So how much different aiming for a map of 65 and this lactate clearance has effects on the clinical nature and the person and the patient in front of us. Um, and then one of the things was the the general medical ward. So the care that you get on the intensive care, by definition, you have more expertise dealing with critically unwell. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily get these on the general medical wards. You get more junior staff. There's less nurses to patients. Um, so actually, can you control the management outside the the outside the trial. It's very hard to determine that, but it's likely that because the expertise isn't there, the care will be different. So that was a whistletop tour of the trial. And as I said, it will add further basis, uh, basis for other studies to evaluate this further. So there's a trial that's going under setup at the moment. Um, it's the EVIS um, and it's early vasopressin sepsis. It'll be multi-centred. I think they're trying to recruit about 3,000 patients. It, basically, there's two, two con, uh, groups. There's fluid ther therapy plus minor vasopressors afterwards, or it's a case of starting peripheral noradrenaline and give fluids as needed. Um, and then this will be initiated in ED and or the admissions units. Um, and that's something I think Leicester may be thinking about um, looking into. Um, so yeah, that is a whistle stop tour. So has anyone got any questions or anything to discuss? Thanks, Dave. That was really good, really nice and clear and well presented. Any questions from anyone? Is there any parallel data like people were given nodded in the second hour rather than the first hour? So that's a very good question that's just come from the back of the room here and it's a question that I've literally wrote down on the bit of paper in front of me. Yeah. I might have missed it, but what was the vasopressor use between the two groups as in the unblinded vasopressor use? So the the unblinded, um, it was essentially the same. The the open, the time to open label vasopressors, there was, there was a longer time to open label vasopressors in the noradrenaline group. Um, which because they're already receiving the vasopressors. Um, so the the ones on the control arm got the vasopressors more or quicker. However, looking at the stats, it wasn't statistically significant. Um, looking at the analysis that they've done. So could you therefore argue that the outcome of the trial is basically showing that if you give norad to people, their blood pressure goes up? Yes. And, and that's what I'm saying. Is it clinically meaningful? Their their primary outcome, because yes, you raise the blood pressure, but actually, the the 
outcomes, the renal replacement therapy, the respiratory failure is still the same. Yeah. Uh, Simon? I mean, I think everyone's going to say something similar. I mean, this trial shows that more adrenaline is better than dextrose. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of, it kind of is in the so what category in my brain. The other thing, I mean, the thing that these trials can be very useful is looking for adverse events. Now, there are only 150 patients, so the risk of not detecting an adverse event is about 2%. So there could be risks less than 2% that weren't detected by the trials, so it's stats into a rule of three. Um, did they record any uh, adverse events, such as extravasation injuries, limb loss, that sort of thing? No, so, so in their discussion, they actually reported, um, they didn't actually mention adverse events other than like things like mortality but they said it's it was well tolerated and there was no adverse events to actually or the use of peripheral noradrenaline um so as you say about the the extra vasation um so it didn't sound like there was any of that in the 155 patients that they recruited but yeah so i would argue it's probably the more useful information from a trial like this is in 150 patients Actually, how many people actually got the NORAD? It so it was, it, it was, it was um, match one to one, so 155 to 155 yeah, okay. in each group. So you could argue in 150 patients, you know, no one had a serious adverse event. Yeah, it was not of NORAD. yeah but it is, but that that at least is something very vaguely interesting, other than NORAD for blood pressure or better than Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, anyway. But yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for your good talk. Any other questions? We just want to double check. Both groups were given like a similar rest of the treatment, like fewers. Yeah. Percentage. Yeah. So the, the question, yeah, I mean, you might have heard that, Steve. I don't know. Yeah. But it was just were the groups otherwise comparable in terms of the treatment? I suspect the answer is probably yes. Yeah. So looking at the fluid therapy in the first hour, it was exactly the same and the fluid therapy up to six hours was exactly the same essentially it was two and a half liters within the first six hours um in both groups yeah brilliant any other questions from anyone on the call doesn't look like it so that was great yeah honest very well presented really nice and clear um, thank you, everyone. Um, there's a really good session today. Um, so same again next Friday. Um, we've got another speaker who will just check what the topic is. Um, actually, it's a joint session next week uh, presented by Dr. Dorothea Morphy, which is a um, it is a consent um, session. So one of the joint GPC sessions. So it should be really good for the portfolio. So yeah, if you come and attend that, there might be some different joining um, details. We'll send those out later on in the week. But yeah. Nice to see everyone and take care. Have a good weekend.